Passive Design Strategies for Non-Domestic Buildings. There was a time when this subject would have been worthy of 45 minutes, if not a full semester. All I can hope to do in 14 minutes is to share some thoughts, provide some handy hints and tips, express some concerns, provide some pointers and pitch for some work. It feels rather like speed dating. I wish to dedicate the lecture to Howard Liddell, founder of Gaia Architects, my husband and a practitioner and innovator in the field of passive design. Howard was the author of the book Eco Minimalism, The Antidote to Eco Bling, published in 2007. He didn't get to see the second edition, published in March 2013. When Howard and I met, we shared what I can only call an unhealthy interest in building services. We didn't like them at all. I had written a book in 1991 on building services and environmental issues at a time where expressing concerns was very new. I followed up my gauntlet throwing with the Environmental Code of Practice for Buildings and Their Services, which now seems a futile attempt to create a pathway to an improved minimalist design approach. Most of the buildings that we've passed on the way here from central London didn't exist then and would have benefited from their designers using the code of practice. At that time, I was also working as advisor to BRE on their Office of the Future, and I met Howard whilst trying to gather best practice case studies for a follow-on book. Howard, meanwhile, was fully engaged in designing passive buildings to optimise daylight, exploit thermal and moisture mass. He was also committed to the use of healthy materials that had minimum mechanical and chemical transformation, preferring timber to plastics and concrete, also a passive and healthy approach. So, building services, what's not to like? They were, and still are, an increasingly costly proportion of building capital and running costs. They require space, maintenance, regular replacement, constant feeding. They are the source of pollution. The simple irony of the profligacy of their use against a backdrop of desperately bad building fabric irritated us. Whilst I was at that time dedicated to designing out building services, Howard most firmly wanted to design out the building services engineer. His experience led him to conclude that the only good building services engineer was the next one. We were staggered at the dearth of examples of buildings using natural resources, whether daylight, sun or shade, and shared our delight when we found them. We knew of examples of excellent environmental control using passive design under much more extreme environmental conditions than our own. The majority of our experience of buildings, south-facing rooms full of computers with useless internal blinds and consequent need for air conditioning made us shiver at the stupidity of it all. One of Howard's architecture students in Norway was led to comment, you can give a lifetime guarantee for every piece of technology that you don't install. We hated bling and uber bling and stuff posing as educational bling, like 16 square metres of solar thermal at an angle of 11 degrees facing east. Some industries seem to know that you don't put solar panels on a HGV, but not the building industry. We also hated spin, the hidden heater under the stairs of the zero energy home. And we were perplexed by the lack of basic technical knowledge and lack of trust in human behaviour. When we asked who would benefit from turning this situation around, we were made to feel like skunks at a headless, heedless picnic. So we founded Gaia Group in 95. Innovation towards affordable, non-toxic, healthy, resource-efficient buildings was at the heart of what Howard and I aspired to. It required research, design, evaluation, feedback, and ultimately capacity building, each project building on the previous, and on our eco-minimalist philosophy. The holistic nature of passive design using human resources and the natural world also fitted with our overall approach to appropriate development, which embraced enhancing biodiversity and supporting communities. Our research embraced things that we found interesting, necessary and preferably funded. Passive ventilation strategies, passive moisture management, daylight optimisation, solar cooling, animal architecture, healthy buildings, money. We looked into money issues with enthusiasm and found that rather than invest in technology, the Germans had supported a programme that invested in passive design. And not only were they able to produce buildings with around half the energy requirement, but also at around 75% of the capital cost. Subsequent Gaia designs built on this knowledge. Glencoe Visitor Centre was specifically designed by Howard to avoid the requirement of a building services engineer and with services at 9% of the cost. McLaren Leisure Centre services were only 16%. For disbelievers, there is an excellent UK example. Arabs decided to design a better office at costs benchmarked against a typical office. It opened in 2001. 
they spent 26% on fabric against a benchmark of 13%, 12% on the roof against 4% benchmark, and less than 5% on services against a benchmark of 22%. We consider that a result. A Caracal school exemplifies Gaia's life cycle approach. The project covers resource effectiveness, optimization, toxicity cycles, human climate control, sustainable forestry, biodiversity, local jobs, and carbon sequestration. The research for the project began in 1997 with a European project with partners in Norway and Finland to look at adding value to timber in the northern periphery. Amongst other things, we discovered a glueless mass timber technique. In 2001, we took a tour of timber buildings in Austria and Germany and built on this knowledge. In response to a contract to contribute to a book on green schools, I took a group of people on a tour of Norwegian schools. Howard responded in 2004 with a tour of German schools. We published the books of the tours. By this time, a client who had been on the Norway tour asked us to write the brief for a school at Karakul, which we did as a passive standard building with a tenth of the heat requirement of a standard school and with natural ventilation. Gaia then successfully bid for the architectural work and built it to embrace all our key principles. As with all our projects, we set about evaluating it and disseminating the findings. On the basis of our passive design approach, we now fulfil a capacity building and quality assurance role for clients and design teams in public, private and third sector business who are seeking passive, healthy buildings. We have seen endless good briefs undermined by the wrong architects, a QS who doesn't understand payoffs between fabric and services, contractors cutting corners and poorly informed clients. Our job is to maintain the essence of the design aspiration through advice from brief writing onwards. Passive design is a process requiring leadership and constant vigilance. I hope that helps. Thank you.